This is my grandmother, Esther, or as I call her, Baba Eja. In these pictures, she is 76 and excited to be back in her hometown of Lodz, Poland for the first time in 55 years. She is a survivor of the Lodz ghetto and the Nazi death camp, Auschwitz. I'm Jacob. My cousin, our mothers, and grandmother Esther visited Poland in 1998. We went because she wanted us to know our history. In Poland, we soon discovered our grandmother could easily recall both her carefree life before the war and the horrors of her teenage years spent during the war. This is a house where I was born. And we lived here for many, many years. In a memoir she wrote some years ago, she said, I had a very loving family, parents, grandparents. Every Saturday and holidays, I and my sisters spend with grandparents. I remember going to the little shul in a small synagogue with my grandfather, who didn't have any grandsons, so instead he took us with him. My children never had a memory growing up with extended family. I remember the wonderful Sabbath lunch, I was 17 years old. The German came to lodge in, the, and of course we were curious. My mother took us out and we went, all three of us, to see how the German marched in. My mother, during the war, war I, Poland was occupied by German too. They told us to put Jewish star and there was a curfew, but that was only the beginning. And then we got a notice that we have to move from our home. And if I recall, it was in January. Prior to World War II, Lodz was an industrial city with a population of over a half million. There was a thriving Jewish community of 220,000 Jews in many synagogues. The most beautiful, the Great Synagogue, was built in 1883. On September 8, 1939, the German army entered Lodz. During World War II, Nazis set up ghettos which were usually located within a city. A ghetto was a city neighborhood which was cut off by barbed wire fences, gates, brick walls. Jews were forced to live in them. They could not leave, not for work, not for travel. During the war, the Nazis built almost a thousand ghettos in German-occupied countries. In February 1940, the Lodz ghetto was created in the poorest part of town. Jews from around the city were forced to leave their homes and move into this one neighborhood. Two months later, that area was surrounded by barbed wire fencing and sealed. Soon, from Vienna, from Berlin, Prague, and Luxembourg, from throughout Europe. Jews were forced to leave their homes and their belongings. They were put into cattle cars and 40,000 sent to the Lodz ghetto. Eventually, over 150,000 Jews were packed into one and a half square miles in Lodz. 5,000 Roma, also known as gypsies, were also forced into the ghetto. The ghetto became a kind of factory prison town where over 70 factories ran on slave labor. Because I knew how to sew, I went in, they were making uniform and the buttons and the finishing. I think was, if I recall, was like from eight to four. All the people were registered that they were working and those people got ration of bread. There was a kitchen and uh, they gave us, like noon, we have to bring a utensil, and they gave us a soup. Slowly, slowly, the race got so bad. We were very hungry and tired. Sometimes we just crawled in the bed and kind of rested, tried to sleep and forget about the hunger. 
food was earned by working in one of many factories making linen, Nazi uniforms, shoes, munitions. Nazis kept ghetto residents in constant fear through arbitrary executions and regular hangings. But soon, the final solution, Hitler's plan to murder all Jews, began. Those not strong enough, young and old alike, began to starve or died of widespread disease. Those unable to work were deported by train to the gas chambers. In nine months of 1942, over 75,000 ghetto residents were deported from Ludge to the Chalmo Killing Center, 45 miles west. They came with their big cars and they made the selection. They took mothers away and they took children. So, you know, people were heartbroken. During the four years, it's hard to describe how much hunger we suffer. We got so little food that it was too much to die and, and too little to live. By spring 1944, deportation started again. Tens of thousands of Lodge residents were deported to their deaths. In August of 1944, the Lodge ghetto was liquidated. All but a few remaining residents were sent to concentration camps in boxcars. You know, we were going on a voy voyage of the unknown. Uh, that was in August, and it was hot to, you know, and August was still very warm in Poland. Nobody knew where we were going. So we went maybe for two and a half days, and there were no toilets at all. So people urinated and did other things. In the car, there was no other way, and we did not get any, absolutely no water, no water. So, so people were dying. I remember we stopped in one small town. The Poles saw us and people tried to open the small window and they said, water, water. And they tried to give us some water in cups and things like that. But the German did not allow to even do that. It, it was, a journey in hell. So we went out and it was a big sign and it say Auschwitz, working camp, something like that. And the irony of it, I recall, there was a band down there who play music. You know, we were so bewildered. We didn't know where we came, and here was a band playing music. Esther, her mother and sister, Mina, had just entered the place where over a million people, Jews, Romas, Poles, were murdered. And then they took us to a big, big hall, and hundreds, hundreds of people. And we still can't stay close with tried to take care of our mother. And then they took us, and then they told us to shed all our clothes. Then they, we went in a shower. Everybody was naked, hundreds of women. And they took us to another room where they shaved our hair, our pubic hair, underarm hair, wherever we have hair. After maybe four weeks, the doctor Mengele came to the camp, to the barracks, and there was another selection where they took my mother and my aunt away. Esther would never see her mother or aunt again. Like thousands of other women, they were undoubtedly murdered in the gas chambers of Auschwitz. Needed for slave labor, the Nazis sent Esther and hundreds of other women by boxcar to the Russian-Polish border, 
With only light clothing, they dug ditches in the cold Polish winter. Although sometimes you thought, oh, I wish I were dead. I don't want to suffer any much like that. But in another minute, you still, I don't know why, but you still want to do I really, I look back and I said, I, everything was so bleak. What was the purpose of living? But somehow, people want to live, even in the worst circumstances. Esther was soon sick. One morning, she couldn't get up to work. She knew sick workers were routinely shot dead. A Nazi soldier came into the barn where she lay. And then one soldier found me, and he said, get out, because we're going to march again. And I said, I can't get out. He said, you know, I have to shoot you. I said, I don't care. You can do whatever you want with me. I really don't care. He came again and looked at me again. He said, get out. I said, I'm not getting nowhere because I'm not able to stay. You know, during the week I was, during the night I was vomiting. I had diarrhea. I, I was so weak that I almost fainted. And then he again went away, came the third time. He threw me a piece of bread and went away. In 1945, Esther was freed by the advancing Soviet army. Soon after entering Auschwitz, she had been separated from her sister. Now, over the next several months, she searched for Mina. Somehow I got to Linz very, very late at night. And I found the hospital. How, don't ask me, because it was late at night. I found other Polish people who were still recuperating, and they said, for whom are you looking? And I explained that uh, I'm also a survivor and I'm looking for my sister. And they said, yeah, she's here. It was kind of a flight of stairs. And I don't know, she did not come down. She flew down, you know. And that was our reunion. During her search for Mina, Esther met Beric Lataris, who would soon become her husband. So my husband came from a family of four. His father came from a family of 12. And my husband did not have even a distant, distant relative left at all. He was left all by him. So when my daughter was born, it was like, a miracle. Here we are, we're going to live again. We're going to start a family. After World War II, my grandparents came to America. Here, they created a loving home and raised two daughters, Lily and Sylvia. My grandmother went from a happy childhood in Ludge, Poland, to being forced to live in the Ludge ghetto to the infamous Auschwitz concentration camp. She once said, I want to go to Auschwitz for personal reasons. I want to stand on the ground of Auschwitz where I was destined to die and say, I am still here and I have given birth to two generations of Jews who will succeed me. She wanted Hitler to know that he failed and she, my Baba Eja, had won. <laughs> 